yeah, please, I think you can. Yeah, let me try yeah, sharing the screen. screen. Yes, you can. How do you make the cartoon figure for your profile? <laughs> I recently <laughs> found a very fun video <laughs> filter. <laughs> it looks like me, right? It, it's quite well made. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. I can. Today, my two kids are here because the nursery was closed due to COVID. So they might run into this room at any time. So I'd like to make it a bit anonymous, you know, <laughs> 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 because it's live stream. So <laughs> my face is okay, but. Can you see the mouse, the pointer following yes. this? Okay, good. do you have a feeling you are going to make a history today why i don't know <laughs> it's about a topic i already wrote a paper about so well it's my it, it might be the first time ever when the speaker speaks using this video filter but <laughs> <laughs> It's a history in that sense. Yeah, we are in the peak of the Omicron P Omicron wave, so it's kind of difficult to do anything. I mean, the nursery is closed almost half the time for the last month or so. So you can teach kids to do math and physics. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> They are still three and six, so it's kind of hard. It's about the time. <laughs> I think we will wait another two minutes. Yeah, yeah. He sent out another reminder one hour ago. Thank you.
I hope Nati will join us, but we may gradually start. Mm -hmm. People may come. So let me start the recording. All right. Okay. Yokoso Minasan, welcome everyone to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter in Math Physics seminar series. It is our great honor, and we are really anticipating this talk for a really long time. We welcome <laughs> Professor Yuji Tajikawa from Kavli IPMU. Uh, Yuji is a world famous physicist. He inspired young generation of physicists, and he works on various topics in quantum field theory with or without supersymmetry, and also various branches of string theory, and also interesting condensed matter, quantum matter. And today, he will be speaking about uh, interplay between these fields, the, 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 the previous mentioned fields. These are the only the absence of global anomalies of heterogeneous string theories. I would like to remind the audience, uh, if you find the time appropriate, please, please feel free to interact with Yuji. You can ask questions and you can raise your hands first. So I just wanna say the last thing, I think today we may going to make a history. So for this audience watching, Takaku Hyogashi Toroku Shide, Beru Kuriku Shide Kudasai. So Yokoso Kyoju, Megashimasu. Please take over, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very generous introduction. Um, so it's a real pleasure for me to be able to talk in this occasion. And the title is, uh, so the topic is about the absence of global anomalies of heteritic string theories. So let me start. So um, today I'd like to talk about string theory. And I think uh, uh, not all of the participants are string theorists. So I, I think I need to start by telling you a bit about uh, what is string theory. But for this talk, I need to assume that you guys are familiar with what quantum field theories are. And then I try to contrast the difference between the quantum field theory and the string theory. So quantum field theory deals with particles, right? Moving in space time. So there are the first quantized approach and also the second quantized approach. But in the first quantized approach, what we do is something like this in pictures. So you first consider quantum mechanics of particles moving in the space time. So this vertical direction is the time. Uh, the horizontal directions are supposed to represent the space and the motion of particles look like lines embedded in the space time, right? So you quantize it and somehow you get the quantum field theory, uh, which describes an extent, extended medium uh, extended throughout the space time. So that's how it works in a very rough sense. So what is string theory? So what is uh, the, the string theory uh, is a slightly upgraded version of that approach in that we consider strings moving in the space time instead of uh, particles. So in cartoon, what you have is that instead of particles moving in the space time, you have strings moving in the space time, uh, joining and splitting in it, and uh, you study it uh, quantum mechanically. So what you do in the end is the quantum field theory of strings moving in the space time. So you have world sheet, two dimensional objects embedded in the space time. And somehow after uh, doing a lot of analysis, you end up with again, some space-time theory, but this time you not only get quantum field theory, but you actually get quantized gravity. You get the quantum gravity theory. So that's the one of the main difference uh, between uh, ordinary quantum field theory and string theory. So there are two noteworthy features of string theory. One is that it contains quantum quantized gravity. So uh, as you might know, historically speaking, string theory was not devised to quantize gravity. So people did not start string theory to study quantum gravity, but rather uh, people wanted to uh, analyze relativistic strings uh, from different purposes to study strong, uh, strong force. But somehow in order to have a consistent way to interpret the motion of relativistic strings, 
uh, people realized that the spectrum automatically contains gravitons, uh, which is the quantized versions of gravity. So again, in cartoons, the situation is something like this. I mean, people asked, give me relativistic strings, right? But, but somehow the, the end result was quantum gravity. Here you are, here's quantum gravity. So everybody was like, no, I didn't order it, but somehow you are force fed with this uh, uh, very uh, complicated thing called quantum gravity. So somehow at present, a string theory is a prime candidate to analyze quantum gravity and people use uh, string theory uh, for that purpose. And for people in the younger generations, um, the fact that string theory contains quantum gravity might become might have become, uh, I mean, almost a standard fact. Well, it's a standard fact, but uh, I'd like to uh, emphasize that there's a lot of mystery uh, involved in it. Why just by considering relativistic strings, uh, you end up uh, analyzing quantum gravity. So, uh, Another aspect of it, I mean, the second feature I'd like to mention, emphasize, is that it's mysteriously consistent. So um, wh whoever uh, studied the basic uh, string theory uh, textbook realized that uh, when you analyze string theory, there are many and many places where it can potentially fail. But uh, it somehow manages to remain consistent thanks to various mysterious mathematical coincidences. So today's talk is about one such instance called the absence of anomalies in string theory. So that's the topic. So before trying to uh, explain the absence of the anomalies in string theory, uh, I'd like to uh, remind you about the basic features of anomalies. Um, so, uh, let's consider a d-dimensional quantum field theory. Let's call it T, uh, which can be anomalous. So what does it mean? Let me first explain the traditional uh, uh, viewpoint. So let's say that ZT of MD of G uh, be its partition function. Here MD is the manifold on which you consider the theory, and G is a metric you chose on it. Ah, so for today's talk, for simplicity, I only consider gravitational anomalies, but everything can be generalized to include uh, gauge backgrounds, etc. But uh, that would make the presentation more complicated because e everywhere where I have G, I need to write not just G, but also the gauge field A. So everything can be straightforwardly uh, generalized to the case with gauge fields, but today I only introduce a non-trivial metric background. So I only talk about gravitational anomalies. Okay, so let ZT be the partition function of the theory T on the manifold M with metric G, right? And let's choose another metric G prime, which is a diffeomorphic, which is obtained by uh, acting by a diffeomorphism to G, right? In, in anomalous theory, what happens is that the partition function at evaluated as metric G prime is not quite equal to the partition function evaluated at G. But they, these two partition functions are different, uh, are related by multiplication by a non-trivial phase exponential to some uh, I theta, where theta depends on the manifold and the two metrics, G and G prime, which are uh, assumed to be equivalent diffeomorphically. Um, so theta is typically computable, but non-zero. Therefore, there's a phase ambiguity in the partition function. This is fine if you are just interested in quantum field theory on a fixed gravitational background, but this poses a problem in quantum gravity where you are supposed to perform path integral over the entire space of metrics because uh, we would like to perform the path integral over the diffeomorphism class of G. So you don't want to overcount G the space of metric, but then uh, you want to fix the integrand, which is supposed to be the uh, ZT. So ZT, if you want to integrate it, uh, needs to be a fixed number, but when theta is non-zero, there's a phase ambiguity, so you cannot integrate it. So that poses a problem. So that's the gravitational anomaly of a gravitational system. So that's a traditional view. 
uh, in a more modern perspective, uh, an anomalous theory T living on uh, D dimensional space time MD uh, is considered to live on the boundary of another theory, which I write A of T on uh, in a space which is one higher dimension, such that the boundary of N uh, is the original manifold MD. So the cartoon is this, you have an original theory T on the boundary M and you have the anomaly theory AT on the bulk. So what happens is that the partition function of the combined system of the boundary theory and the bulk theory uh, is well-defined and it, it doesn't have any problem. But if you separate them uh, arbitrarily into the boundary part and the bulk part, um, the individual parts are not uh, invariant. So this poses a problem if you want to consider quantum gravity theory on the boundary, because you just cannot perform path integral over just the metric on the boundary, because the metric is necessarily continued into the bulk. So this means that, again, a string theory is inconsistent. A quantum gravity theory is inconsistent unless this anomaly theory in one dimensional higher situation is trivial. So is it the case? So that's a long-standing problem. Ah, but before getting that, um, let, let me explain to you uh, another facet uh, of anomalies that it can be split into the perturbative part and the global part. So the perturbative part of the anomaly theory specifies the value of this anomaly theory AT when the one dimensional higher spacetime N is itself a boundary of a two dimensional higher system X. So when N is a boundary of X, then the partition function of the anomaly theory is given by the exponential two pi i of a integral of a certain characteristic polynomial it evaluated on x. So x uh, is an auxiliary manifold and i is known as the anomaly polynomial of t. And another effect of i is that suppose you have two manifolds n and n prime connected by an internal about, about space X, then the partition function of the anomaly theory on N and N prime uh, are related in this way. So it's, the ratio is given by, again, the exponential of two pi i of the integral of the anomaly polynomial in the middle. So the previous relation is just a special case when the N prime is empty, right? So, Suppose the perturbative part of the anomaly vanishes. So let's say it vanish. Then uh, the previous uh, relation just means that the partition function of the anomaly theory evaluated on n and n prime is equal. This means that uh, anomaly theory determines a map, uh, and I mean the partition function of the anomaly theory determines a map from something called uh, the boldism group in d plus one dimensions to u1 where this boldism group is just the group of equivalence classes of manifolds in d plus one dimensions, where the equivalence relation n and uh, simic n prime is just de defined by the existence of this uh, bulk space x connecting n and n prime. And the structure is something you can choose uh, depending on your uh, theory of interest. So, the structure can be a just a spin structure or just an orientation or pin plus or pin minus of your choice. So that's the global anomaly. After uh, uh, reviewing the basic features of anomalies, let me talk about the anomaly of the heterotic string theory. Uh, that's the topic, main topic of uh, this talk, right? But let me start by warming up, warming ourselves up by studying the 10 dimensional situation. So that's the basic uh, setup. So uh, unfortunately, this is not the lectures for <laughs> to, to introduce you to string theory. So uh, I don't have much time, uh, 
telling you exactly what string theory is, but for the purpose of today's talk, 10D heteroctic string theory is just a very elaborate mathematical machine, mathematical physical machine, which does the following. Its input is a modular invariant two-dimensional CFT, T world sheet, with uh, whose who central charge is 16 and zero. So left moving central charge is 16 and right moving central charge is zero. And somehow its output is a 10-dimensional quantum gravity. So that depends on the input uh, world sheet theory. So in pictures, what you have is you have an abstract world sheet, right? And there's an embedding of that world sheet into 10-dimensional space-time. And uh, you add this input world sheet to CFT on top, and you perform path integral over all possible uh, embedding, such embedding F. And somehow it gives it us a quantum gravity theory. So before discussing the anomaly of the space-time theory in 10 dimensions, because we are dealing with uh, two-dimensional QFT on the world sheet, we need to first discuss the world sheet anomaly. That's a preliminary step. Uh, the very important uh, outcome of this analysis, the preliminary analysis, is that the 10-dimensional space-time is not just equipped with the metric, but you always have to specify a three-form H uh, satisfying the following equation. DH is the Pontryagin class, first Pontryagin class of the world, a uh, space-time divided by two. Why? Well, if you know, if you are a string theorist, you learned this by computing the uh, scattering amplitude, etc. But uh, there's a way to uh, explain it just from analyzing the anomaly of the world sheet. So uh, I didn't, I haven't told you yet, but uh, this world sheet theory is a supersymmetric two-dimensional theory in that this embedding map F from the world sheet to the space-time is accompanied by a fermionic degrees of freedom. So as a world sheet theory, uh, this two-dimensional system has 10 right-moving fermions coming from the pullback of the tangent bundle of the target space to the world sheet. And that's purely right-moving and there's no left-moving counterpart. So from the point of view of the two dimensions, it's a chiral system. And because of that, you know, it has an anomaly. So these fermions taking values in the pullback of the target space tangent uh, bundle, it has an anomaly which can be computed easily. So the anomaly polynomial is uh, P1 of target space over two. So as a two dimensional theory, at a fixed, embedding, it doesn't have a problem, but we are supposed to perform path integral over F, the, em the embedding from to into the target space. But this anomaly prevents us from doing that. So we need to somehow cancel it. The, our way out is that in string theory, there's something called B field, whose field of strength is called H from historical reasons such that it contributes to the anomaly uh, of, of the system. So the anomaly contribution from H, the three-form field H, is just its integral over this uh, three-dimensional space. So supposing that dH is equal to P1 over two, this contribution from the H field and the contribution from the fermions exactly cancel out so that the total anomaly of the world sheet is one. So it, it becomes trivial and now you can perform the path integral over the embedding F, right? So, so in the heteroctic string theory, the existence of H is very essential even before uh, talking about uh, talking about how to perform the path integral in the space-time gravity part. 
So in this uh, modern ap approach, the normalization uh, of proportionality coefficient of this equation is completely fixed just by analyzing the anomaly of the worksheet. Excuse me, Yuji. So this yes, rela relation can also be viewed as a trivialization of the P1 structure? That's right. Yeah. So it's Thank you for the question. So I will come back to this. And so it's called by it's called as string structure by mathematicians. Yes. So I just finished discussing the uh, anomaly of the world sheet. So let's move on to the more interesting case of anomaly of the space time theory. So let me remind you that 10D heterostring string theory is an elaborate machine whose input is a 2D CFT with uh, chiral center size 16, and the output is a 10 dimensional quantum gravity. Again, I don't have much time to tell you how these rules are derived, but let me just tell you that the vacuum state of the world sheet theory uh, becomes 10 dimensional gravitino. Gravitino uh, for condensed matter physicists is just a fermion with an additional vector, space time vector index. So it's a spin uh, three half fermion. And uh, next excited state with uh, L0 being one, gives you uh, ordinary spin one half fermions in 10 dimensions. So that's the rule. So the state with L0 being zero in the world sheet gives you gravitino, massless spin three halves particles in space time. And the next excited state, uh, each of them gives you a 10 dimensional massless fermions. So that's how it works. Now you can open uh, a classic works by Alvare Gomez and Witten, who, who computed the uh, anomaly of those massless fields in 10 dimensions. So the anomaly polynomial of 10D gravitino is this. So I just copied it. And the uh, anomaly polynomial of a spin uh, one half fermion is instead this. It's a complicated uh, formula, but you, you can readily, readily work, work out. But it, they drastically simplify in string theory. Because as I said, there's a three point field H such that DH is P1 over two. So as a uh, cohomology class, P1 vanishes. So you can just drop the part proportional to P1. So what it remains is just P3. So the gravity now is 31 divided by 3,780 times P3. And uh, n copies of spin one half fermions gives you this, right? And therefore, uh, in order for the anomalies to cancel, you need to choose a very specific n, right? So the sum of the two is zero, if and only if n is 31 times 16, which is 496. So this is uh, forced on us just by consideration of the space time. So the anomaly is, is the anomaly canceled? Well, that now depends on the property of the internal world sheet, right? And it is known for a long time that there are exactly two such CFTs. So it, it, it is either E8 times E8 uh, current algebra or SO32 current algebra together with one particular uh, representation. So that's, they are the only two uh, consistent SQL 16 chiral CFT known at the time when string theory was born in 1984. But later mathematicians actually have proved that these two are the only such uh, chiral CFT. So at present in 2022, uh, we can safely say that there are really just two choices in 10 dimensions. And in the and using that using that profound result, we can easily check uh, what is this number n. So that was the number of states of world sheet theory with L zero being one, right? And that's related to dimension of G of this current algebra, and that's four hundred and ninety six. So the anomaly is miraculously cancelled. I mean, the perturbative part is miraculously cancelled. Good. Uh, in fact. 
uh, this analysis can be done without the actual classification of such two-dimensional CFTs. Uh, a rougher more uh, analysis using just modular invariance suffices. So how? Let me explain how it goes. So for let's start with some two-dimensional wall sheet theory with C C L being sixteen, and you consider its torus partition function, right? So it's a torus to trace uh, over the state of Q to the power L zero minus C over twenty four. And because it's 16, you get this uh, fractional power Q to minus two thirds and uh, the vacuum is one and there are N states at level zero equals one, that, that, that. So this is the torus partition function. And this th function needs to be modular invariant up to a phase uh, determined by the gravitational anomaly of the world sheet theory. So the theory of modular functions tells us that unique such function of this form which is modular invariant up to the phase, is the product of eta in data kind eta and uh, no fourth Einstein series to some particular power. So it's just a mathematical, I mean, basic mathematical consequence of the theory of modular functions. And it has this form, I mean, Q to this part particular power of Q, and then uh, it's minus 16th power of eta, and the square of the Eisenstein series. And if you expand it out, you get exactly 496. Good. So we learned that the modular invariance of the part, I mean, the theory of modular functions imply that the 10 dimensional anomaly polynomial vanishes. Do you have any questions at this moment? Yeah, maybe I can ask a question. Um, so it seems that this this cancellation depends very heavily on the chiral central charge, right? That's right. Is, is there so I I believe the number sixteen is picked like prior to this discovery of anomaly cancellation, right? That's right. So can you, can you maybe comment a little bit about where it came from originally? Ah, okay. So um. I don't think I, what I'm going to say is not historically correct, but <laughs> the current understanding is the following. So in string theory, you are supposed to integrate over uh, all of the world sheet metric, right? Mm -hmm. So, but uh, you want to integrate over only the conformal class of the metric. And uh, when you do that, you need to introduce ghosts. So in your perturbative quantization of gauge there, you need to introduce ghosts, which fixes your gauge, mm -hmm. on, in, which imposes the gauge condition. And similarly, you need to introduce uh, ghosts, which fixes the conformal gauge. Mm -hmm. And the ghost system itself has conformal anomaly. So the structure of the string theory requires you that the central charge of the world sheet theory is exactly canceled by the central charge of the ghost system. So that the entirety of the world sheet theory has zero central charge. So that uh, so that the so that you can perform the path integral. So, mm -hmm. so that the partition function of the world sheet theory is well defined. So uh, where did I Here. So what happens is that uh, in heterotic string theory, the left movers are supposed to be non supersymmetric, and therefore you introduce non supersymmetric conformal ghost system. Mm -hmm. It is called the PC system. And its central charge is 26, sorry, minus 26. Mm -hmm. Therefore, to have a zero central charge system, the, the matter part, I mean, of the left moving system needs to have dimension 26. And because we assume space time to be 10 dimensional, uh, it contains C equals 10 CFT on the left moving part. So you need to provide 16 additional central charge. And, and this number 10 itself is determined by the condition for the right movers. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that the right movers is supposed to be n equals one supersymmetric. So the uh, Super conformal gauge fixing is necessary 
and the ghosts associated to it, called known as beta gamma system, uh, has a central charge of 15, I'm sorry, minus 15. Therefore, you need to have plus 15 contribution uh, from the right movers. And with n equals one supersymmetry, uh, individual, individual uh, bosonic degrees of freedom comes with one majoral fermion. So one direction corresponds to one plus one half. I mean, boson contributes one and fermion contributes one half. Therefore, you, in total, you have three halves from each direction. Therefore, 10 gives you uh, 15 uh, as the total central charge. And that exactly cancels the conformal central mm -hmm. charge. So that's how these numbers are determined, even before uh, discussing other consistency conditions. Right. OK, thank, thank you. you. Can I ask another question? Sorry. Yes, please. Yeah, so so you compared two expression uh, from conform field theory and uh, one from the other formula from, I thought, some modular That's uh, right. invariance. And then uh, uh, the other formula is unique. So by comparing the, yeah, this one, yeah, comparing this formula, you can conclude that uh, n equals to 496. So my question is that, uh, so these two expressions must agree also in higher orders, right? Yes. The then, uh, can, can you uh, gain other useful information from by comparing higher order expansions? Um, so in this particular case, we actually don't, because okay. in this case, it is known that such two-dimensional CFTs are either this one or the other one. I so see. they are completely known. I see. But this type of analysis is very helpful uh, in a different situation where you, you don't have such classifications. So in, so in general, uh, these expansions contain infinite number of terms, right? Mm -hmm. But in the chiral CFT, typically mm -hmm. the partition function is constrained by this modular invariance. And there are typically only finite number of basis functions which satisfy mm -hmm. the required modular properties. Which means that among these infinite number of integers, uh, a finite number suffices to fix all of them. So in, in, yeah, so in this particular case, the leading term just determines everything. Okay. But if the space of such modular function is two-dimensional, mm -hmm. then fixing the leading two coefficients just fixes everything. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So if everyone is OK, let me get to the global anomaly of the heteristic string theory. So we learned that the perturbity anomaly cancels, right? So that means that when two 11-dimensional manifold n is related, connected by a bulk 12-dimensional manifold x, then the heteristic anomaly associated to 11-dimensional manifold n and n prime are the same. So this means that we have a homomorphism from omega string 11 to u1, right? So let me remind you that this omega string 11 is just the equivalence class of such manifolds, n and n prime, but with a crucial condition that the metric of the bulk and the boundary is always accompanied by the three form field h. Solving this important condition dh is equal to p1 over two, right? So we need to analyze this uh, mathematical beast. However, surprisingly, already in 1971, a certain mathematician, Gian Balvo, computed this group up to dimension 16, right? So z, z to z to z24, so it looks interesting, right? Very random appearing, uh, groups, but somehow, from miraculous reasons, at exactly the required place when d is 11, the group is zero, right? Group is trivial. Therefore, I mean, this source of the function is trivial. Therefore, this uh, anomaly function itself needs to be trivial. Therefore, the anomaly is absent. I mean, the global anomaly is absent, right? So there are 
wasn't much to talk about about the global anomaly, at least if, if you consider just the pure gra gravitational anomaly part. You might ask, why was this strange Bordism group of manifolds, not just with metric or spin structure, but with this condition dh equals p1 over 2, interesting to mathematicians in 1971. Remember, uh, uh, 1971 is way before string theory was, I mean, string theory itself, I think, was kind of discussed, but uh, super string theory wasn't born. It was in 1984. So in those days, mathematicians didn't call it string structure, but, but still, this structure was something very natural to them for a certain person to write a paper on about it, right? So let me explain. So consider tangent bundles, or more generally orthogonal bundles, on manifolds, M, right? Let's try to analyze its non-triviality. So well, first, non-triviality is associated to the, uh, the components of ON. So you know that orthogonal transformations are separated into uh, SO and, and the parity part. So, so those which preserve orientation, with those which doesn't, right? So associated, so that's given by the pi zero of the group itself, and that's associated to a loop in the space time. And uh, that gives you the Stiefel fitting class W1. So when W1 vanishes, you can assign orientation on the manifolds consistently over the entire manifold. And uh, orientation is a choice of such trivialization, and that's uh, the orientation. The next non-triviality, of the orthogonal bundle is associated to pi one of SON, which is again Z2. And uh, that can be detected by considering a two dimensional surface embedded in the space time. And that, course, that gives you the spin structure. Sorry, that gives you Stiefel Fitti class W2. And if it's vanishing, you can choose its trivialization, and that's the spin structure. And now you can lift the group ON. SON to spin. The third non triviality is then, then associated to the first non trivial homotopy group of spin N, which is pi 3 of spin N, which is Z. Correspondingly, uh, you can consider characteristic class associated to it, which is this P1 over 2 I ha have been referring to repeatedly. So the natural uh, integrally quantized characteristic class for S or N is P1, but it's always divisible by two uh, on a spin uh, with, with spin structure. So P1 over two is an integer valued uh, non-triviality or obstruction of the bundle. So when P1 over two is zero and trivialized, uh, that's what gives, you, gives us the string structure. So the string structure, uh, which is dictated to us, by the consideration of the world sheet anomaly cancellation is in fact a very natural object to consider in mathematics too purely uh, from algebraic topological consideration of trivializing an orthogonal bundle. So you first want to trivialize W1, which is the orientation, and then you want to trivialize W2, which gives us the spin structure. And then the next thing is P1 over two, and that gives us the string structure. So that's why, Jan Valvo wanted to consider it in 1971. So let me summarize what I discussed so far. In 10D string theory, the part of the monomial cancels uh, because the theory of modular forms knew the ratio of 496 between I gravi the gravitino anomaly polynomial and the anomaly polynomial of spin one half fermion, right? And then the global an anomaly vanished because for some strange reasons, this String boldism was trivial. So that's what I explained to you so far. Do you have any questions? Okay, I can continue. Yeah, my son just came into the room, so. Maybe naive question. Yes, please. Is there some relation also to trivialization of uh, maybe Stephen Winnie class W4? I think this might be naive, but uh, I just ah, asked in case so the dimension. Trivializing W4 doesn't completely trivialize P1 over 2. Um, well, P, 
Mode 2 reduction of P1 is W4. So in the spin structure, if you trivialize the spin structure, I, I thought W4 is automatically trivialized. But, but yeah, you can consider trivialization of intermediate objects. So there are papers by Porsche, if I remember correctly, uh, who considered the trivialization as W3. So you can consider various intermediate uh, cases. But uh, th these are kind of uh, natural obstructions to consider because they are directly associated to the homotopy groups of the structure group itself. Yeah. And the reason I think mathematicians also give a name string structure, is there some intuitive way to think about them? No, I, I, um, the mathematicians started to call it string structure because of uh, its relation to elliptic genera uh, found by Ed Witten. So, so the, the reason why they call this strong structure is because this relation appears in theoretic string theory. So not, nothing more than that. Okay, thanks. All right. So uh, I reviewed the anomaly cancellation in 10 dimensions. That was kind of known uh, in the 80s, but I re re reviewed it in a, from a modern perspective. So the main uh, development I described in uh, our, our paper was how to generalize that argument to lower dimensional heterotic compactifications. So, uh, so let me summarize what I'm going to say. So the perturbative anomaly of lower dimensional heterotic compactifications was shown to vanish in a very similar manner using the theory of modular functions. So that was done in late 80s by a series of papers written by various subsets of Lerchier, Nielsen, Skelekens, and Warner. That's a very nice paper, set of papers, uh, but I'm not going to review them. The, the remaining question was, what, uh, how about the global anomaly in those cases? Well, why did that question remain uh, until 2021, right? Uh, it's almost 30 years after the original things were settled. Well, to start with, no general theory of global anomalies was known until very recently, until a, a few years ago, except perhaps implicitly a very, very small number of people such as Friedel with them, right? So, I mean, uh, at least 10 years ago, most people understood global anomalies individually, but uh, so you can check that individual global anomalies cancel, but uh, people didn't think that you can show that the entirety of global anomalies can cancel, right? Luckily, the study of SPT phases on the condensed matter side from around 2010 sparked a lot of activities in HEPTH and math AT. So we now have a veritable understanding of the general form of global anomaly using bodisms, and I already explained to you. And this turns out to be crucial. So let's get started with the main part of the talk. Um, so I said the 10 dimensional string theory has the following structure, right? String is embedded into 10 dimensional space time and you had this CFT with C L, L equals 16. People study a lot about geometric compactifications by which I mean you split, split 10 dimensional space time into D dimensional general space time times some fixed 10 minus D dimensional internal manifold. As I said, this embedding map from the world C to the space time comes with a fermionic super partner, which is purely right moving. So the left moving part of this internal manifold gives you 10 minus D to the left moving central charge. And the right moving central charge is given by 10 minus D times three halves which is just a contribution for one boson and one Majorana fermion. One plus one half is three halves, right? But once you start studying this setup, nothing stops us from considering more general heterotic compactification where you have a D-dimensional general space time 
and the rest is given as uh, abstract C SCFT such that CL is 16 plus 10 minus D and CR is three halves times 10 minus D. So this is uh, the generic non-geometric compactifications of heteroteric strings down to D dimensions. Anomalies of heteroteric strings in geometric compactification is guaranteed to cancel, right? Because although we compactify this internal 10 minus dimensions into some fixed compact manifold, you can always forget about the fact that we did the compactification and treat this entire 10 dimensional part as the geometric space time and apply the machinery we just did. So both part of the and the global part of the anomaly are guaranteed to vanish in this case. Just apply 10 dimensional anomaly analysis here, right? But in this generalized setup where the internal part is an abstract two dimensional SCFT, you can do that, right? Because some part of the space time has become a more, more abstract SCFT. How should we proceed? So the best case scenario is to have a boldism theory, not of a geometric manifold, but of a super conformal field theory, right? So somehow the stringy version of space-time geometry is uh, SCFT. So we want to analyze what happens if you think about it uh, as a modified version of geometry. So that's in some sense what I'm going to do. But for now, uh, let's proceed uh, somehow uh, naively. So I'm going to give you two examples of global anomalies we need to be worried about. One is the 4D written anomaly. So 4D written anomaly is about the SU2 uh, gauge anomaly in four dimensions when you have doublet fermions. So for, for that purpose, let's say D equals four. The world sheet theory is a 2D SCFT with this central charge because of the reason I just explained. It's 22 on the left moving side and nine on the right moving side. And if the world sheet theory has SU2 flavor symmetry, then the resulting 4D quantum gravity theory has SU2 gauge group. So that's the rule. And uh, the R sector states of the two dimensional world sheet with L0 being one and L0 bar being zero gives four dimensional chiral fermions where 4D chirality is given by the right moving fermion number on the world sheet. So that's the rule coming from heteroteric strings. A chiral fermion in the doublet of SU2 has a global anomaly associated to pi four SU2, which is Z2 which is uh, from modern perspective, more properly associated to omega spin four of BSU2, right? So let's say that the doublet irreducible irre irre representation of SU2 appears N2 times in the R sector state of the world sheet theory with L0 being one and L0 bar is zero and that put on the back here. The rule of the heteric string theory tells us that there are N2 uh, doublet fermions, right? Therefore, uh, this standard knowledge in the textbooks of string theory tells us that the 4D quantum gravity theory you obtain from heteric strings, uh, starting from a two dimensional world sheet theory, is afflicted with written anomaly unless this number N2 is zero, mod two. Right? So that's a very strange condition on the world sheet theory. So, so the general question here is that you consider a class of CFTs in two dimensions and you are asked to count the number of states with particular L0 and you need to show that the number is even. Otherwise, the system is inconsistent. Another case of global anomaly, concrete global anomaly we can discuss is two-dimensional uh, Z24. 
anomaly. So in the case D goes to the world seat theory now has a slightly different central charge. Left moving central charge is 24 and the right moving one is 12. So the R sector states again of L0 equals one give 2D space time chiral fermions. And the rule of a heterostring string theory tells me that 2D space time chirality is given by the right moving fermion number again. So let's say the net number of chiral fermions is N. So that's the difference between the right moving number and left moving fermion number. So the combined anomaly polynomial of the two dimensional space time fermion is n times p1 over 48, which is zero, because as I said, p1 is homologically trivial. So the perturbative part of the space time theory is all, already zero. But this can leave a global anomaly uh, because of. Uh, as the following issue. So let me remind you what was uh, the anomaly, right? So you consider hetetic theory on M2. So M2 is not the world sheet anymore. It's a space-time uh, two-dimensional manifold. And you, to, the anomaly theory is defined on the world sheet, sorry, defined on the three-dimensional theory. And the anomaly polynomial X4 is evaluated on a four-dimensional manifold whose boundary is N3. And we are saying that the P1 over 48 times N, that's the anomaly polynomial contribution, can be canceled, I mean, can be considered trivial because of this crucial relation, DH is P1 over two. So N times P1 over 48 is N over 24, times uh, the integral of h over n3. So that's what it means, right? But this means that the heterotic theory in two dimensions have the anomaly theory a hat with this contribution n over 24 integrated over n3 over h, right? So you can perform the computation of z partition function of the heterotic theory on a three manifold it's the simplest three manifold S3 with the integral of H field equals one. So this needs to be quantized. So it's int integrally quantized, so it's one. Then you can easily compute this number, right? Exponential of two pi i n over 24 times one. So this is exactly the partition function of the anomaly theory. And this can be non-zero. So not, this can be non-trivial if n is not the multiple of 24. It turns out that this manifold is the generator of the Boldism group omega string three, which is Z24. So this is a generator of the dual of the Boldism group. So the global anomaly of the two dimensional heterotic compactifications is given by uh, such a map. And this is given by sending one of the generator of this Boltism group into exponential of two pi over n over 24. So this is non-trivial, meaning that it's anomalous unless n is divisible by 24. So this requires that for the heteric theory to be consistent, uh, the trace, I mean, with an index uh, at L0 equals one with minus, so, this trace needs to be a uh, multiple of 24. So that's the cons that's the requirement. So let's summarize the two cases of the anomalies uh, I discussed. Both have the same structure. So the input to the head string construction is the world sheet SCFT, which is two dimensional and, and n equals zero comma one supersymmetric. And CN and CRs are given by this, depending on the dimensions. You consider the space of R sector states. R sector is just a periodic sector of fermions on S1. And you demand L0 bar to be zero and L0 to be one. And the conclusion is that heterotic string theory constructed from this world sheet has a global anomaly unless in the case of D equals four, V contains an even number of two dimensional irreducible representations. 
And in, when D is two, uh, unless the written index of this subspace V is divisible by 24. So these are kind of questions physicists like me don't know how to answer at present, but math comes to the rescue. So that's what I wanted to tell you the rest in the rest of my talk. Do you have any questions at this moment? Yes, please. Um, so is this SU2 just some global symmetry of the system? Ah, yes, I forgot to write that we assume that in four dimensional case, uh, uh -huh. SCFT itself has SU2 current algebra. Yeah. Okay, okay. I see. All right, thanks. Yeah. You were, th thank you for asking. So this is a question uh, everyone, even people who hate string theory can uh, understand. Right? It's a specific question about two-dimensional uh, conformal theory. So if you find such a counterexample, then you can uh, say that string theory is inconsistent. Yes, please. Uh, the manifold generator for this omega three string, the Z twenty four. I I think I maybe I read people say it's a three sphere with H flux, or are oh, there yeah, some right. are there some other way maybe just other way to detect by some more exotic or to some other, other, other type of manifolds we know? Um, so in the three-dimensional case, you can explicitly write the um, dual of this omega string, which is obtained in this way. So for any manifold, this Z A hat is given by just the sum of this integral of H plus the uh, eta invariant associated to the fermions. Yeah, so this formula just says that the variation of H, uh, yeah, go ahead, Ju Juven. No, that's the same question, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so the point is that if you add the contribution from H and the eta invariant, then the metric variation cancels. So this gives you exactly the required uh, element in the dual of the Bodhism group. So for any complicated uh, three-dimensional manifold with H field equipped, you can compute uh, in which class of Bodhism group it, it belongs to. Yeah, it's a very concrete formula. Thanks. Okay. So let me fi finally proceed to the discussion of how uh, these global anomalies can be argued to cancel using uh, some, in, some developments in mathematics. So that's done by using topological modular forms. So we already used modular forms, right? To see the cancellation of the part part of the anomaly, but topological modular forms uh, also shows us the cancellation of the global part. So that's the issue. So the topological modular forms, TMF, generalize and refine the ring of modular forms. It was mathematically constructed around at the turn of the century by Hopkins and his collaborators using an amalgam of algebraic topology and algebraic geometry. So the construction was announced in an ICM talk, which you can find here. So TMF has an index, uh, uh, integer comes with an integer called degree at new, which is an integer, and each TMF new is an abelian group. Uh, so, so for our purpose, uh, contextual description of this TMF group by Segal, Stoltz, and Teichner plays a very important role. So that conjecture says the following: this abelian group is just a group of two-dimensional n equals zero comma one supersymmetric theory with this particular uh, central charge difference. I mean, the gravitational anomaly up to continuous deformation. So it's like a Bordism group, right? Um, so, or of SCFT. 
So you consider super conformal figures in two dimensions and you want to classify them in a very rough manner. So it's like, it's similar to the analysis of uh, SPT phase, right? You want to classify 2D systems in a very rough manner. Here, a lot of the deformations are just giving you whatever marginal or irrelevant relevant deformations going up and down RLG flows, or even adding a SUSY breaking sector is allowed. So it's a very rough classification of 2D super conformal, uh, sorry, 2D, 2D supersymmetric field theory. So uh, this conjecture was developed for a long time in the math literature. And uh, ah, so in particular, our SCFTT is a specific case of supersymmetric theory. So it defines a class in TMF if we believe this conjecture. Why is this conjecture plausible? Well, there are various uh, checks, but the main one is the following. So mathematicians constructed a certain map phi w, which is a map from TMF group to the group of modular forms of weight mu over two with integer coefficient on poles. And such that uh, if you have a theory T corresponding to the TMF uh, class, then the map under phi W is given by the some power of eta invariant times the elliptic genus where well, elliptic genus of the theory T is just the uh, trace over the R sector vector state of minus one to the power FR. So this is the right moving fermion number. And you have the standard uh, Q to the power L zero minus CL over 24. So this is the standard elliptic genus physicists use. And you multiply it by eta to Dedekind eta to, to some power. So this is a mathematical uh, con convenience factor because this standard elliptic genus we use uh, for SCFT is not quite modular invariant, but you have some anomalous phase due to gravitational anomaly. And this eta, uh, data kin theta factor is designed to cancel all that. So this, is, this improves modular invariance properties and phi w is exactly modular invariant, not up to the factor, but including the phase. Mathematicians call this phi w as the Witten genus. That's why we put the subscript w here. Mathematicians also construct this map sigma, which I, I call sigma, which is the quantization map under the conjecture. So you start from a new dimensional manifold with three forms satisfying dh of equal p1 over two, right? So that's a pair of M and H. I should ha have written G, M, G, and H. And then physically, we expect that we, we can construct N equals zero comma one supersymmetric sigma model, two dimensional sigma model, whose target space is M and H. And that should uh, give a class in TMF new. So this is already interesting to us physicists, right? Physicists know that there is a sigma model anomaly, fermion anomaly, unless uh, DH is P1 over two, as I explained at the very beginning of the talk, right? But mathematicians know this constraint in their own way, which I don't understand. I tried to read how they construct this map, but this condition appears in a very strange place and I still don't understand that. But this means that we have, we have the same condition, right? To create TMF class or 2D CFT. And the crucial, the crux of the matter is that we can compose these two operations. So starting from new dimensional manifold with the uh, required H flux, mathematician can construct a TMF class and then you can map it to a modular form, right? Physicists can do the same thing. Starting from a manifold with an H flux, we can consider N equals one supersymmetric sigma model and we can compute the, it's elliptic genus. Uh, multiplied by this convenience factor, right? So this is a very first example, almost the first example of the 
a super symmetric localization, which is very popular in string theory community these days. But you can apply that to this system, and you get some particular uh, modular forms. But what physicists do in the, on this line, and what mathematicians do on the other side, side agrees. So this is a important piece of uh, hint that these two operations, sigma and phi w, do exactly what we expect under this conjecture that this TMF class uh, captures the deformation invariant of supersymmetric theory in two dimensions. So assuming this conjecture, now I can show that the two-dimensional Z24 anomaly vanishes. So let me remind you what was the problem. So let's let T be a 2D SCFT with central charge 24 and 12, right? Let V be the space of R sector states, I mean, periodic fermion states with L0 bar 0, L0 bar equals 1. Heteric string theory constructed from TWS has an anomaly unless uh, the trace over the space V of minus one to the fermion number is divisible by 24. So how can you show such as things? Let me rephrase it slightly differently. So the elliptic genera is defined as follows. And because CL is 24, it starts with the power Q minus one and the next power is Q, sorry, constant and you have all q1 terms and a let's say this is aq minus one plus b so what you need to show is that b is divisible by 24 right so let's use tmf right so let so this t worksheet is a certain two-dimensional theory with this central charge but this determines a class in tmf right so this turns out to be TMF with new being minus 24. So the, its written genus as computed by mathematician should equal what physicists think, uh, what physicists say as eta to 24th times the, its elliptic genus. So it's eta to minus 24 times this AQ minus one plus P. So this is a modular form of weight minus 12 with integer coefficients and pole of at most order two because eta invariant contains q to minus, sorry, q to power one over 24. So this combines to pole of order two. So using standard facts about modular functions, you know, we know that there are only two basis states. One basis state is just uh, delta inverse where delta is the 24th power of eta. Another combination is theta E8 times cubed times delta minus two, where, where theta E8 is the a lattice theta function associated to E8, or equivalent, it's just a normalized fourth Eisenstein series. Anyway, so the standard modular invariance tells us that this is it. So that's exactly uses what most Oshikawa-san asked me before. So here, there's a, no classification of TWS, but as far as its elliptic genus or the anomaly contribution is concerned, every information is hidden into these two coefficients. So mathematics before TMF can only say as far as this point, you have these two coefficients, but I cannot fix it. So you cannot say B is divisible by 24. But there's a theorem of Hopkins saying that uh, the image of phi W from TMF 24K contains a multiple of delta K only if its coefficient V is a multiple of 24 over GCD 24 comma K. That's a mysterious theorem, but let's assume that. Here we have TMF minus 24, so K is minus one. So this GCD is one. So B needs to be a multiple of 24. So that exactly we need to show the cancellation of the heterotic anomaly in two dimensions. So it's done. So this theorem of Hopkins is exactly what we need. How about trying to answer a four-dimensional uh, question? 
So the four-dimensional question is as follows. Let's say T is a two-dimensional SCFT with the center charge 22, 9 with SU2 symmetry, right? And V, let V be the space of our sextile states with L0 being one and L0 bar is zero as before. Heteristic string theory constructed from TWS has an anomaly unless, unless this uh, space V contains an even number of two dimensional irreducible, irreducible representation of SU2. It's really a similar question. TMF should be able to answer that because such a two dimensional theory should determine a class in something called equivalent TMF. So it's a more sophisticated object than already sophisticated mathematical objects called TMF. And this TMF group should know uh, the required model two behavior, just as we saw in the two dimensional Z24 case. But this approach hasn't materialized just yet because this group is very difficult to compute. I don't know how to compute it. I asked a few mathematicians and uh, they said that it's difficult. And also the analog of Hopkins theorem about the image of uh, Witten genus hasn't been uh, obtained for the equivalent TMF. So unfortunately, I cannot just quote the math literature to answer this question. I think this is a good, in, in, this might be an interesting question for mathematicians to work on, but at least I cannot just quote the already available results. And even this worked, you would, we would then be forced to analyze different space time dimension capital D with different symmetry group G one by one, right? So I discussed how that D equals to G trivial case uh, can be analyzed. Right, And then I said that uh, D equals four, G equals SU2 case is a difficult mathematical problem, but should be doable. Nobody has done that. But even assuming that it can be done, I mean, you need to work each pair D, D comma G every time, right? So that might allow us to write infinite number of papers solving each case one by one, but that doesn't give us close to the real solution, general solution. That was the state of affairs to me uh, exactly one year ago. But at the time I learned uh, of the existence of a certain mathematician, Mayuko Yamashita, who's a, who's a female uh, young mathematician in Kyoto. Very, very brilliant. Uh, uh, yeah, surprisingly brilliant. And uh, I asked her how she would think about this question. And uh, her answer was as mathematical as you can expect, right? So her answer was that I should not think the question individually, right? So we should generalize the question as far as possible and solve the question in its entirety. So, and that's exactly what she did. So what, I, what we did is that, was that I translated the question into a purely TMF question and she just solved it for general D and G. So that's, so I, I, what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is to try to explain what happens. <laughs> so it uses a lot of algebraic topology, unfortunately. Uh, but let me first try to give some rough physical ideas behind the, the derivation of the fact that all possible heterotic global anomalies vanish. So, actually, I'm not sure whether I can ask a question. Please, please go ahead. So uh, sometimes this may not be related, but sometimes for global anomalies, we may be able to, uh, you know, cancel by gapped base, like ah, gap TQFT. That's right, that's right. So I was wondering, say, whether there are su such a thing that can play a role in those analysis of global anomalies in your case. For example, Witten anomaly, we cannot preserve SU2 to get a gap TQFT to cancel it, but how about others that uh, encounter it in the work you present? Ah, so thank you. I I'd like to thank Juven for asking a very important question. So when I started this uh, analysis uh, a few years ago, I thought, that we might be able to find some additional topological ingredient in string theory, heteritic string theory, which needs to be present 
in order to cancel uh, an uncancelled uh, global anomaly of the heteritic string fermions. So he, here I'm going to just consider anomalies coming from the heteritic string, sorry, fermions and uh, massless fields in heteritic theory. But somehow, so, so there is a possibility that some, there is some topological states, topological degrees of freedom missed so far in the analysis of the heteritic string theory, which needs to be added. But to characterize that, or to find such an example, uh, I wanted to have a general method to compute the anomaly of the heteritic theory. So that's one, one of my uh, motivations. But somehow Mayuko showed that just by considering the fermions and the standard of massless fields in heteritic string, the global anomaly just vanishes in a very beautiful way. So yeah, so in the expositions, in the talks I gave, I never explained this interesting possibility, which was one of my main motivations. But yeah, but, but yeah, thank you for asking. So unfortunately that doesn't happen. Okay, so, yeah. so that doesn't happen for the heterotic string, but just for the sake of uh, the anomaly, can, can those anomalies still be canceled by some gap sector? Suppose other theories might, might need that. Uh, yeah, uh, um, so that can still happen in other ty string okay. theory, like type two. Because yeah. to, to today's analysis only applies to heterotic strings, which is just one of the five uh, partitive string theories. And the analysis in the type two case is significantly different. Yeah. In fact, the anomaly of the type two string is known to be actually, uh, actually not canceled if you consider just closed strings. So type two strings contain open strings, and the anomaly, global anomaly, there are cases where global anomaly is canceled only after including the open string sector. So uh, this type of analysis won't work. So you, in order for this analysis to work in type two string, you need to consider at least boundaries to the world sheet and you need to sum over all possible boundaries. So that will significantly uh, complicate the analysis and the corresponding uh, required uh, mathematics is not here either. So that's why I'm only talking about heterotic strings. So I didn't add any such disclaimers at the start of the talk. <laughs> I should have, but uh, yeah. Thank you for raising the issue. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think Miguel might not be here, but I wonder whether some of the Miguel Montero's result was uh, for the type 2B string, maybe you have a choice to add in the topological degree of freedoms. I, I think I think we have some conversation, but I forget the end of his result. I don't know whether you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's really difficult to decide. Yeah. So type so I should have emphasized at the beginning that the type two situation is not at all settled. It's a whole new level of difficulties involved. Th mm. Thank you for raising this. Thank, thank you. So so yeah. So I'd like to thank Juven and. Let me repeat that somehow for the analysis of the heteritic strings, TMF works very well. So let me tell you why it works very well. So let's just recall a traditional way of analyzing Witten's SU2 anomaly, right? So SU2 global anomaly in 4D is associated to a non-trivial loop in the space of gauge configurations. So I don't know how to draw a cartoon about SU2 gauge configurations on M4. So it's an infinite dimension of very complicated space. But there's a non-trivial loop associated to the pi four of SU2, which is Z2, right? So the written anomaly is uh, realized as the phase minus one you obtain by going around this non-trivial loop and coming back to the gauge equivalent configurations. So if it is minus one, then partition function is non-trivial non trivially five word over the configuration and you cannot perform the past integral. So that's the one traditional way of understanding the global anomaly. So let's analyze the heterotic global anomaly in a similar fashion. So as I said, the heterotic com compactification, a single configuration is just d-dimensional space time with two dimensional n equals zero comma one SCFT with this require the central charge, right? So that's a single configuration. And the global anomaly of traditional type is associated to non-trivial loops in such configurations. So it's a very complicated space. So, 
so far, we talked about the case when this is dimension D is 10, and this is just central charge 16. And now we are talking about the more general case of keeping capital D dimension geometric and uh, uh, choosing some T C CFT here. But you can go all the way down, right, to, to include this part into the SCFT2 because that's the most general situation, right? So this is just a special case of world sheet theory with central charge 26 and 15, right? And the global anomaly of traditional type is associated to non-trivial loops in such configurations, right? So what can cause the global anomaly of traditional type is the pi one, the homotopy group, non the group of non-trivial loops in the space of n equals zero comma one SCFTs with this number, right? So this is exactly the kind of things a TMF trans, TMF and the Atia, sorry, stoltz tahina conjecture uh, tries to answer. You see, I said that the TMF nu is uh, under the conjecture equivalent to the group of 2D supersymmetric theory with fixed difference of central charge up to continuous deformation. But uh, I mean, this can be rephrased as saying that TMF nu is the group of components of the space of two-dimensional n zero comma one supersymmetric series, series with this new being two minus two new given by the chiral central charge, right? But, but part of the stoltz tahina conjecture is that this is not, this is just uh, one particular case, but in fact, you can say that pi k topology of the space, homotopy groups of this space is in fact given by TMF nu plus k. So this is a part of the conjecture which I didn't quote at the beginning because this looks more complicated. So what can cause the global anomaly of heterotic string, as I said, is pi one of the space of 2D n equals zero comma super symmetric series with this new, right? And the Taihina Stoltz conjecture equal equates it with TMF new plus one. Here new is two times 15 minus 26, which is minus 22. This means, so therefore, what can cause a global heterotic anomaly is just TMF of minus 21. Now you open a textbook on TMF and there's a huge table of TMF groups. This happens to be zero, just as in the case of 11 dimensional string voltism group. So somehow mathematics tells us that it's zero. So there is no such non-trivial loop in the configuration space of, of heterotic string theories, and therefore there can be no global anomaly. So that's, that shows uh, how you can use TMF to argue that the anomaly is not there. So, let me give you a bit more precise description. Um, or maybe I, I, I think I can skip this part. Uh, Juven told me that I can take as much time as you, I want, but unfortunately the nursery is closed due to COVID. So uh, for, for my personal reasons, I cannot take as much time as I want. <laughs> so I, already, I think I already told you uh, the main idea behind the, uh, <laughs> behind the mathematical uh, work. So for any D and G you choose, let me just recap what, what I did in the general case, right? So you go to an extreme case of turning this part into CFT too, right? Then what can cause global anomaly is just a non-trivial loop in this uh, uh, space of CFT, space of heterotic configurations, right? So this is what you need to analyze. And that's exactly, the kind of thing what stoltz tahina conjectures equates with TMF and the resulting, I mean, then the TMF group, you, which you need to analyze the TMF minus 21, right? And that happens to be zero. So there's no global anomaly. So this works for any dimension and any group. Right. So, yeah. So I, I skipped a few pages. So let, let me take another 10 minutes or so to come to finish my talk.
by giving you some comments. So clearly we are not really done. What I did was to transfer the question of global anomalies of hydrogen strings to the validity of this segal stolz teichner conjecture saying that TMF group, which is mathematically well-defined, is in fact the space of deformation classes of super two-dimensional supersymmetric theories, right? Well, it will be very hard to get the mathematically rigorous proof because the right-hand side is not even defined yet, right? So that's a mathematician's job, I guess. But so instead, as a physicist, let me consider what this equality, conjectural equality tells us, assuming its validity, right? So many subtle properties of the left-hand side is already known. So that translates to many subtle properties of two-dimensional theories, which are not at all apparent to us. One example is the crucial input we just used, right? So TMF minus 21 is a trivial group. So in our language, this means the space of two-dimensional n equals zero comma one theory with central charge difference minus 21 is continuously connected. So any such theories can be continuously changed to each other. How do we even begin to understand this in our own way? I have really zero idea, right? So yeah, so it would be fun uh, if we can figure it out, but I don't know how to proceed at present. Another example is this relation TMF3 Z24. This means that uh, 2D n equals 0, 0,1 theory with this central charge difference is classified into Z24. Example in each class K, modulo 24, are believed to be given by just SU2 versus amino Wittenler model, a supersymmetric version of versus amino Wittenler model with level K. Uh, so how to see this model 24 behavior in K was discussed in this paper by Gayoto, Johnson, Freight, and Witten. And then how to get this Z24 invariant from such a two-dimensional theory is also discussed by Gayo to Johnson Frey. So in this particular case, we have a fairly nice understanding of this uh, issue that, that new equals uh, three super conformal theories classified into Z24. Another issue is this, uh, result of Hopkins I used, right? So you start from TMF and compute Witten genus. And uh, Witten genus is B times the data kint, sorry, modular discriminant to the power K. If and only if this coefficient B is a multiple of 24 by GCD 24 comma K. It's a complicated statement. So let me translate back to physics language. It's a simple fact then. So consider a two dimensional n equals zero comma one supersymmetric theory with this central charge difference. If its elliptic genus or Witten genus is Witten uh, index is constant. So, so, so you see, this is a supersymmetric theory, but it's supersymmetric only on the left moving side. So, so right moving side, the left movers can be non-supersymmetric. But suppose if you take this Witten index, all of the bosonic, non supersymmetric side also completely trivialized. So that's a very specific situation. So if its elliptic genus is constant, then it is a multiple of 24 by, divided by GCD 24 comma K. So that's the statement. Um, so the theories satisfying this uh, constraint were constructed for small K in a published paper by Gayot and Johnson Freight from 2018. And there's an unpublished work by Gayot and Johnson Freight who constructed it for all K, uh, which was announced in a uh, talk by RCTP last autumn. But it isn't understood as far as I know why this elliptic genus can't be any smaller, right? So the mathematics tells us that elliptic genus can be a multiple of this, right? And uh, these smart guys uh, constructed uh, SCFCs, which does exactly that. But uh, why can't you find a smaller CFD? I don't know. In particular, specific case of the previous statement is this. If the elliptic genus 
of two dimensional n equals zero comma one theory is simply just one, right? It's a very nice theory. It's almost like trivial vacuum, right? Then that forces us to have the central charge difference to be a multiple of 288. Why? I have zero idea. So Guyot and Johnson Freight constructed the converse in that they constructed the theory with this particular central charge such that the elliptic genus is one. But uh, yeah, there are, there are a lot of things to be done still. Okay, so today I considered global anomalies in heterogeneous string theories. And uh, such questions can be answered, as I showed, that using the mathematical theory of TMF and using the Siegel Stoltz Teichner conjecture, uh, the anomalies can be cancelled. We can show that the anomalies can be cancelled. And finally, this conjecture predicts many unexplored properties in 2D theories, which I think are worth pursuing. And I always emphasize this point every time I give this kind of kind of talk. The list of HEPTH papers on TMS is not very long. The exhaustive list is this at present. So uh, yeah, it's a young field and newcomers are welcome. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Superashi Kohen no arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you. Yeah, you're doing arigatou gozaimasu. Arigatou gozaimashita. So any question from the audience, please? Yeah, please. Um, just to clarify, TMFs are, uh, anyways, thank you for the very nice talk, by the way. Um, thank you very much. The uh, TMFs are cohomology theories, right? That's right. Um, so essentially, when you say that TMF nu are abelian groups, you're considering, technically speaking, TMFs on the point. That's right. Okay. So, um, well, what I know is that um, I think there's been a proposal, I think a few years ago, that um, says that you can model TMFs using bundles of boundary conditions of conformal nets of free fermions. Right. And yeah, I, I don't think it's um, completely proven, but at least the 24 periodicity was demonstrated on both sides. Um, I see. Um, yeah, 24 squared, right, periodicity. I, 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 I've heard that statement, but I haven't seen the written up paper or preprint. Uh, do you know if it's available? Uh, I would like yeah. to... Uh, I think I can dig it up. That that would be very helpful. Uh, let me remember the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you can send me afterwards <laughs> if you find it. Yeah, I, I I I didn't find it on the archive at least. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, this one. I'll send it in the chat. Ah, that's great. Uh, right, thank you. Yeah, so I right. cannot say anything significant until I learn it. Um, and let me say, send all of you the link of my slide files in the meantime. Yeah, yeah, let me, let me study it. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, um, yeah, that, that, that would be nice. So, so definitely I, I have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn from mm -hmm. mathematicians. So how, how to translate uh, these things. So, so let, let me say, so, so the, this paper uh, you may, uh, kindly told, told me um, uses something much closer to physics to try to construct TMF, mm -hmm. right? But the let me say something uh, kind of orthogonal to it. The traditional definition of TMF constructed by Hopkins et al. uses uh, a lot of algebraic geometry over mm -hmm. Z, right? So various torsion phenomena, like TMF3 being 24 in that approach, uh, comes from analyzing elliptic genus, elliptic curves over uh, fields of characteristic two and three. Mm -hmm. 
So that that makes it very perplexing to us physicists who are not used to characteristic p phenomena, right? So, mm -hmm. so in in these wor works by Gaioto, Johnson, Fred, Witten, this Z24 phenomenon comes from analyzing uh, analytic properties of modular forms, etc. But somehow mathematicians, the original definition of TMF uh, is done by analyzing elliptic curves mm -hmm. over characters two and three. So, so that seems to be telling us something because uh, the same elliptic curve, at least when characteristic zero, appears very prominently in physical analysis because we just consider uh, two-dimensional theory on that particular elliptic curve as two-dimensional space-time, right? So uh, at least uh, this traditional definition of TMF seems to tell us, physicists, that you can consider, we can consider these two-dimensional theories on Riemann surfaces defined over characteristic P. So th that seems to be the case, but I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. So let, let me study that paper. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. And also, I guess one uh, little comment is that mm -hmm. um, on just 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 from what I took away from this paper and while I was reading it like a couple of years ago, <laughs> mm -hmm. that um, is that if this were true, that you can actually model TMFs with uh, these conformal net uh, boundary conditions, mm -hmm. this would play a similar role as K theory with the Clifford algebra bundles, right? Right, right. Like, but it's for like string uh, structures instead of spin right. structures. Yeah. Right. So in that sense, if we actually, um, because from the Kitaev paper, um, this is kind of rudimentary, I guess, pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, from Kitaev's paper about um, the periodic table of, uh, you know, topological insulators and oops. Like from his paper about topological insulators and superconductors, there's a sense in which you can understand, oh, you know, continuous deformations of these free Hamiltonians of fermions, and you can map that to essentially the extension problem for the Clifford algebra bundles. Right, right. Uh -huh. So um, in that sense, that could also form the bridge. Like this, this article um, here it could also form the bridge for understanding what exactly are you know continuous deformations of these SCFTs. Um, right, right. Yeah, th thank you very much uh, for, for the comment. So that points to another issue I uh, didn't have time to mention. Let me go back to the very beginning of the talk. Uh, yeah, here. So, so string theory is a machine which produces quantum gravity theory from quantum field theory strings, right? And Stoltz Teichner conjecture uh, maps this quantum field theory of strings, a 2D theory, into TMF class, right? And then quantum gravity theory. As for the quantum gravity theory, we only consider its anomaly. So that's characterized by uh, Anderson duo of the string boldism group. So mm -hmm. what we are analyzing was a certain natural transformation from TMF to string boldism and dual of string boldism group. And, and our result is that it vanishes. So that's the mathematical statement what we showed. Mm -hmm. So you can consider a simpler version in the quantum field theory setting. So in the case of quantum mechanics of particles, what you need to do is the one dimensional version of stoltz teichner conjecture, which is actually mathematically proven, which says that one dimensional uh, supersymmetric quantum mechanics uh, has, it, I mean, the space of such systems is a classifying space of K theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And then the anomaly of quantum field theory is given by, uh, in this case, the Anderson duo of the spin boldism group. Mm -hmm. So in this case, what you do is a natural to find a natural transformation from uh, the K theory to the Anderson dual of the spin boldism group. Mm -hmm. And that is an, in, in fact, non-trivial map. Yeah. A very natural, natural transformation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's non-trivial. And what mm -hmm. we just did, mathematically speaking, is to uh, upgrade everything from K theory mm -hmm. to TMF mm -hmm. and spin boldism to string boldism, but somehow everything simplifies at the end and it just becomes zero. So that's 
what, mm-hmm. what we discussed. So, so yeah, I think pursuing this analogy between K-theory and TMF should be very important in mm-hmm. uh, uh, getting a better understanding of the whole situation. Mm-hmm. And it's good that you mentioned this uh, this fact because I think I saw this one paper, I forgot the name of it. Um, so this one paper that does exactly what you're talking about, <laughs> like the the map from um, TMF to uh, string borderisms. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. There's, 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 that's the paper where mathematicians constructed the, the string orientation, I guess, right? So I don't, uh, I don't really remember, but it was about um, it was about invertible topological phases, actually. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but that, that, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. But yes, yeah, thank so... you for the very nice talk. Good. Thank you very much. Any other question, comments? Oh, Yunqing has a question. Go ahead, Yunqing. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. So uh, I have a naive question. So you, you told us that uh, TMF, the theory of TMF tells us that, that when we compatify the heterogeneous string to D dimension, then the anomaly vanishes for arbitrary D. But yeah. here for, for, the, for the physics side to make sense that D should be smaller or equal than 10. Ah, but right. I think that the mathematical result tells us that when, even when I, we assume D is bigger than 10, uh, the anomaly still vanishes. Right? Well, mathematically, I, I didn't use the fact that D, capital D, is between uh, 0 and 26. Or 0 and yeah. 10. Yeah, that yeah. That wasn't somehow necessary. So I, I don't know why. So is there like a physical interpretation of, uh, of this mathematical fact when D is bigger than 10? Um, so in string theory literature, there are various papers where you consider supercritical string theory in D larger than 10. Uh-huh. Um, you can do that in some sense by introducing non-trivial dilaton profile. Mm-hmm. So, so you can change the, you can lower the central charge of this space-time part by introducing some dilaton profile. And that would make C, that would allow you to have higher central charge in the CFT part. So, so I haven't seriously studied the anomaly cancellation in that context. There are some works, but, but yeah. Uh, in fact, Simeon Hellerman at Kavli Ka- IPMU uh-huh. uh, is one of the <laughs> main person carrying out this analysis. So <laughs> it might be good to yeah ask him about it. Yeah. So, uh, but I the see. issue, but, but the issue is. That if you include non-trivial dilaton profile, uh, I mean, um, ten, the space-time part often becomes non-compact. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. In, so, but but anomaly analysis usually assumes that the the space-time part becomes compact, right? In, in the end, you and evaluate the anomaly invertible theory on a compact manifold. And we say that to characterize global anomalies, that's enough, right? Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, but, yes. Uh, but in order to consider hypercritical string theory where D is very big or even or negative, you, you need to include uh, intrinsically non-compact directions. So I don't know how to make sense of it, uh, at least mathematically. Yeah. I see, I so, see. So this stolz teichner conjecture uh, assumes that the, uh, let me go to that page. Well, maybe it, it, it's not necessary. Ah, here I didn't include the con- condition that this theory is compact. In co- Compact meaning that the spectrum is discrete. Yeah. Uh-huh. Even in the very large uh, in- infinite volume limit? Um, so yeah, you can consider very large volume, but you need to keep it uh, finite. So that's, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, that's important. I if see, you I allow see. really non-compact manifold, then there are counter examples. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, could you remind us what are the counter examples? Right. Um, oh. Well, 
So he, I, I know Yunqing read the papers by Gayotto Witten, right? Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Gayotto Witten, Johnson and Fred. So they use such non compact theories exactly oh, yeah, yeah. for the purpose of con con connecting two compact theories. So definitely okay, okay. non compact that, theory. I see. Yeah, also, in order to get this T24 valued invariant, they use non compact uh, thing, right? So, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's definitely related, but uh, yeah. I see, I see. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I also have a question, and maybe if other people want to ask, please feel free. A uh, naive question about slide number 64. Uh huh. 64. 64? Yes. So, like to make sure uh, this uh, group extension has the uh, normal, normal subgroup has the, the ca capture the global anomaly, I suppose. Right. And the, the quotient part is the, the perturbative local anomaly. Right, right. So this is a global and this is a local. Local, part. yes. And the I just want to make sure the, the full total extended group. Do you have any non-trivial extension for this structure? Or no, is that no, just I mean, this is zero. This is zero. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so that's the that's the important part. So so this <laughs> perturbative part is highly non-trivial, but string theory construction tells us that somehow this map P is zero. But that was uh, shown in the late 80s by Lerche, Skelekens, and Warner, and Nielsen, as I said. So in, in my paper with Mayuko, I translated their old derivation in a new language. So we, we, we also have a mathematical understanding of this part too. But, some, but, but the, so, so the perturbative part and the cancellation of the perturbative part is kind of non-trivial still in this generalized setting. But once that part is understood, everything is uh, boiled down to, or ascribed to the vanishing of this group TMF minus 21. So, I mean, in some sense, this TMF minus 21, uh, evaluated the point, is very, very crucial uh, to the overall consistency of heteroscopic strings. So maybe this number minus 21 has some meaning, but I don't know what. Yeah, this minus 21, uh, for, if we, for, for, for mathematicians, it might be interesting to know that there are, I mean, three versions of TMF, capital TMF and the lower TMF, and the final version, which is called capital T, small m, m, small f. And capital T, small m, small f is Anderson self-dual with this exact shift minus 21. So there should be some mathematical reasons between these relations, but I don't know exactly what. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? If not, I think uh, we should thank Professor Yuji Tachikawa. Uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. Subayashi Koen, arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>